to 10 minutes, there will be a flashing light just to draw your attention, but you do not This is uh, towards then, yeah. but I will know from this. Yeah. Uh, and even if you cross 0, it is a bit Um Hello, Dr. Prema Rajagopalan from the Humanities and Social Sciences Department. So, in this course, I am going to give you a very different perspective of looking at uh, building materials. Uh, I do not know whether you have been exposed to looking at uh, construction, buildings and materials uh, other than a technological viewpoint. So, in this lecture, I am trying to uh, address that component which will also I hope prove uh, give you some kind of new insights into understanding buildings. Now, when uh, we start looking at the built environment vis a vis the natural environment, generally what are the three major aspects that uh, one would like to uh, consider? The technical efficiency definitely, it depends on the kind of building you are going to make and you want to optimize on various aspects of uh, uh, all kinds of technological advances uh, or if you want to understand some traditional buildings or heritage sites, uh, same way you will make an evaluation of not only the structures, but also of the materials that have been used. I am not going to look at that. The second most important aspect is of course, economic viability, which weaves into the cost factor of making these buildings. Uh, that is also in a different domain, which is very, very important though, because the affordability aspect, the kind of availability aspect of the materials uh, that you may want to use, that goes into a different domain. But the third aspect of looking at the built environment is what for me, since I am a sociologist is uh, regarding the social acceptability of any of these uh, settlements or structures, which together what we may call as the built environment. But what do we mean by this? Now, uh, the built environment is something that is man made in contrast to the natural environment, which is maybe God given. Now, how does the built environment interface with the society or with the people? There are cert, uh, certain questions which are uh, basically addressed or which are taken up to understand this interface between the built environment and society. Largely, they will uh, address this relationship between the environment and the behavior of human beings. So, this kind of a linkage between the environment and the behavior of human beings uh, can be broken into three subsets. What aspects of human behavior are considered or are taken into consideration when we construct anything? Secondly, on the other hand, what aspects of the built environment in turn influence affect both positively and negatively the behavior of human beings who actually use this built environment. And the third most important question in this relationship, it is a two way relationship uh, is what are the mechanisms that actually operate, which can be uh, used to understand this kind of a linkage. Now, in this exercise or in this effort to understand this linkage, what we find is the culture of the people or the human beings becomes most important in trying to understand this kind of a linkage. Now, culture is, uh, is not a new word to all of you. We use it very, very uh, freely in all kinds of uh, situations, but for a sociologist, what does culture mean or uh, what do we understand by using this word culture in a very, very scientific way. So, for us culture in sociology is 
a combination or is a composite of what we may call the mentifacts and the artifacts. that an individual acquires as a member of the society. Now, what do we mean by that? By mentifacts, we refer to all the ideas, values, beliefs, customs, rituals that we learn, that we learn in order to make our behavior appropriate in any situation. That is right, what is right, what is not right, what is wrong, what is appropriate what is accepted, what is approved and what should be the actual behavior. The artifacts, the set of artifacts definitely is very easy to understand. It refers to what we may call the material culture that we learn to use and operate. So, the material culture is something that you can see, you can touch, you can use which are inanimate. Uh, so, these set of artifacts that we again, we see that where your kind of, uh, uh, I would say your um, knowledge on technology will be very, very uh, right in trying to evaluate or understand the set of artifacts, but the artifacts range from all levels of products that man creates and uses. So, technology for us sometimes is nothing but an improvisation in design of many of the things that we create and use. So, culture for us is that complex whole, uh, which includes both the artifacts and mentifacts that an individual, what is the most important component of this definition is, what an individual acquires, these mentifacts and artifacts that an individual acquires is a member of any group. So, we acquire or we learn certain kinds of mentifacts as a member of a family, as a member of a community, it could be the student group, as a member of a larger society, as member of a larger country. So, whether it is patriotism, loyalty towards our country, something that we learn that we should practice. So, uh, that is why for us in sociology, culture is a very dynamic concept. Why? Because these arti artifacts and mentifacts keep changing. It evolves over periods of time in and it is both diachronically and synchronically we will say that is over periods of time in a particular society. So, we can trace the culture of a culture in a particular domain of a particular country of a specific country or even of a specific group, maybe over a period of time like say 100 years or 200 years and also you can study culture synchronically at a particular point of time across communities, across cultures. Now, what is this whole understanding for? We are trying to relate it to the built environment. We are trying to see how this as I started the relationship between built environment and behavior. So, individuals are constantly looking or we can understand the behavior of people in particular settings and relate it to the culture that he or she carries with him or her to that built environment. So, uh, in this process and that is why I told you culture is very dynamic, it keeps changing and that is why the challenge also to understand the behavior of people in different settings at a particular point of time becomes more and more complex. Now, from there jumping to this particular the context of this course on uh, building materials. So, what are the different or the several options that one has in trying to make the built environment? Here also you see the whole trajectory of the evolution of the different materials that have been used in various contexts, various countries and across a period of time. So, to very quickly go through them list, we will see that some of the ancient buildings or in olden times or for that matter even uh, nowadays certain kind of climatic regions 
largely require a particular kind of material like say wood what you probably popular more uh, are familiar with use of timber. Then there have been building structures made out of stone. So, now you will call it a particular ancient form of you can say dwelling or whatever. Then moving to more modern times we have had evolution in building materials. See this whole relationship between the built environment and the natural environment is nothing but a relationship between man and nature. So, earlier times all the uh, when man was not able to overpower nature he tried to kind of live according to the vagaries of nature. But as and when knowledge or science grew the gradual evolution of man's conquering nature or the vagaries of nature is very much reflected in many of the materials that may have come by. Because one of the basic instincts of man is to survive, survive most of these vagaries. So, to construct those kind of structures which are safe and which are also long standing and which in many ways ensures his survival becomes very important. So, you see this kind of a trajectory of you can say evolution or change in the kind of materials that man uses to shelter himself and gradually expand it for other purposes uh, can be reflected in many of the newer materials steel or concrete or more currently glass and of course, the what I understand is combinations of more than one material composites as you call it and the several kind of new materials that have emerged. Now, what do we uh, what kind of an understanding do we gain by looking at this whole evolution of the various kinds of materials. Now, you see the use of these materials. So, broadly speaking I would differentiate or separate uh, the use of materials as those made in public spaces and those that are used in private spaces. So, to give a list of you can say the large number of buildings or structures that come under the category of public space you can uh, it can range from educational institutions like this or hospitals to you can say places of commerce workplaces to places of worship to infrastructure uh, like roads or airports or ports or what have you. Uh, and you do see the variation you will probably uh, if you start looking at it from a different perspective get away from what you may say the efficiency of these materials in those structures. Why is it that we use certain kinds of materials in say a place of worship vis a vis a place of commerce. Now, you find the relationship or the link with that material and the behavior or you can say the culture of you can say the, the particular community, the society or that group. So, that is reflected to a great extent see this uh, uh, whole argument of the built environment and its relationship with culture is in earlier times we can say that the built environment is a very very significant and a clear manifestation of the culture. So, the built environment reflects the ideas, values, beliefs of the people. If they have to build something, so in earlier times the tallest building will always be the place of worship. You can never have a building uh, any other structure which can be higher than the place of worship, because the respect that you give to that kind of a structure is more important and that is learnt or internalized by that group or the community. And therefore, to have a tall structure, so we have in India the temples, the tallest gopuram and things like that and more and more effort that is being made to make this viable, to make it long lasting. So, why were stones used and then what kind of you can say skill that we require 
to construct these tall structures and we know that they are standing even now 200, 300 years or so. And that kind of that ideas, values, beliefs of the community towards certain kinds of structures that you build and therefore, that is also uh, very important in terms of the materials that you choose to make those structures. Now, for a person, for an outsider, it would be very easy to identify. Now, what is this structure for somebody who is not familiar with that particular culture? So, by differentiating be between different kinds of structures and the kind of materials that you may use for an outsider, what we say you get the hints or you get we say the cues, I will deal with it a little later. Those hints tell you, oh, this is a place of worship. My behavior should not be very wild it is something sacred and therefore, how do I use that space. So, it is not only the I would say the size or the location, but the use of materials also become very very significant, very very relevant. A uh, vis a vis when you want to have a place of work or place of a commerce, you want to showcase that kind of maybe um, the idea that this is different. So, there is a lot of activity or for that matter, there is a lot of uh, discussion going on now, when newer uh, structures for polity or where decisions are made by the state, the new secretariat in Chennai. So, what kind of a design, what kind of materials are used, power and architecture, how transparent is it? So, does it reflect the activities that go inside? So, in trying to kind of convey to the larger public, not only the design, but the kind of materials, whereas as I told you, as I mentioned earlier, a place of commerce, you want to showcase maybe opulence, uh, maybe you want to uh, exhibit certain kinds of prosperity uh, by through the materials that you use or maybe make it looking very, very transparent as I told you the design itself that uh, the decisions that are made inside this uh, structure, which is you can say holding all the power of the state uh, is made in a very, very democratic or a transparent way. So, some of these uh, as I told you the values that get reflected in the kind of structures is is very important to, to define the behavior of people, who not only use it, but also who come here as maybe visitors, as tourists. So, for them to kind of understand these become very important. Uh, in terms of private spaces, the use of built material largely, uh, you can say uh, is restricted to individual spaces, la housing. But in what ways can they be what we call personalize those kind of spaces. And we see what I understand from my uh, colleagues in the civil engineering department is most of the uh, cost of the building goes in personalizing aspects of these materials, which can be which can be seen in the many many ways in which uh, you can change the flooring or you can change the roofing or the walls or the exterior, the landscaping and things like that. And here again, a lot of focus or importance is brought into the materials, which immediately conveys to somebody who is viewing, who is coming from outside, ah, this the use, the cost, it ref not only reflects the cost, but it also reflects maybe the taste or the aesthetics or in other words, the ideas and beliefs of the person who is going to be owning that specific place. So, in what way can we uh, see this link between or what do they actually reflect? Broadly speaking, what do these buildings convey? What do these buildings convey through the use of these kind of materials? So, you know it is uh, I mean materials are important because they contribute to creating certain structures and these structures together constitute the built environment. One of the main aspects that we as sociologists look for is, what kind of an identity? 
what kind of an identity or what do we mean something special, something unique, those characteristics of the people who use it do these buildings reflect. And in this definitely there is a difference between individual identity and collective identity. All of us want to kind of what we may say attract some kind of an attention, we want to be different. That is why we have even different names and here you may not only have your formal names, you may also have your nicknames or whatever it is. But still we may see that in a large group the student community want to, there will be some who want to be still different, exclusive, either boys growing long hair or wearing a earring or wearing different kinds of clothes or whatever it is. Now do these aspects get reflected? That is why sometimes when we see, we say this building stands out, it is bizarre, it does not mix, it does not match, it does not blend with the rest of the environment. Why does it happen that way? So, there is a component of that individual who is occupying, who has created that built environment, who has created that structure, who wants to catch the attention. Otherwise, we will not look at it. If they are continuous, monotonous, same color like we have those huge apartment uh, complexes in communist Russia or China, nothing so great, nothing so exciting or interesting. So, each one wants to be different if you have a space to do so. So, if you cannot do it with the exterior, as I told you, there is a way out, there is a space, there is a provision to personalize your identity through the interiors. Now, there is also a question of collective identity like we say we are Indians. So, Indians are different. So, when we in sociology there is a lot of uh, research going on on diaspora communities, where a particular community moves out to another country and tries to relive their own culture. So, like you know Chinatowns. So, as soon as you enter that kind of a structure outside, we know that this is a particular kind of a community. So, you know what to expect, not only the kind of shops, the materials, the kind of people, the kind of you can say the smell or the, the noise or whatever it is. And that is conveyed through some kind of a very, very typical external structure. So, there is this difference between an individual identity and a collective identity and all of us go through it continuously in our lives. And we do have these both individual identity and collective identity coexisting and at the same time we are members of different collectives. So, we may be a member of a particular student community, a member of a professional body, a, member, a, a citizen of a particular country. So, we try and see that is why some Indians say Oh, in my house in America, I have the jasmine creeper. So, that kind of indicates, oh, this is an Indian house or whatever, where in, in warmer um, climates like say Florida or so. So, there is this constant, you can say, complementarity and many times a conflict that also goes on between the individual identity and the collective identity. Essentially, we have multiple identities. Now, I will show you some pictures which can kind of make those uh, differences clear. The second aspect that a built environment also conveyed to a viewer is by the kind of a structure that you may see, it also tells us to what class the economic status that particular section, the settlement or that individual himself belongs to and therefore, for us it immediately implies something much more serious, the social distance, the hierarchy. Can I walk into this? What will happen? Can I walk freely into a slum? Because there are these mental constructs, what kind of a behavior will I expect? So, the built environment immediately conveys this kind of a social distance, not simply a question of hierarchy, yes, but the distance that we would like to maintain or that distance which would in, in other words uh, influence our behavior in that particular space. And of course, the most important component of culture is the ideas, values and beliefs of that particular group as I mentioned even earlier 
it is very very strongly reflected in the kind of cultures. Now, to give you some quick glimpses of uh, these three aspects of the uh, you can say aspects of the built environment, what do these uh, uh, buildings convey. So, in terms of individual identity everybody knows the first picture is that of the white house. So, who, who can live there? Who is the one who is living there will be the head of the state. So, it immediately says it is not and the others can only go as a tourist and that too in restricted areas to go and see. But that particular thing the white house all over the world it has some kind of an identity and it relates to the person with that kind of a position and power. The collective identity as I mentioned even earlier this is a picture of our own parliament in Delhi the circularity uh, often times we know that a square table or a rectangle table to some extent uh, reflects hierarchy whereas, a circular table, table and here a circular building also reflects more of collegiate ship uh, more of you can say less of this kind of a social distance. So, how do these buildings try to capture? The second one I mentioned was about the class structure and hierarchy very very easy to kind of understand. So, this is uh, definitely not uh, economically weaker section poor housing the poor and it is definitely not the first picture is not that of the elite rich, but it is it reflects a middle class uh, locality the kind of um, houses apartment blocks. Uh, of course, in middle class we have the lower middle class, the middle middle class and the upper class, but definitely this kind of a structure the kind of people who are going to be living there uh, the kind of behavior that you may uh, encounter. So, if you are looking for a particular uh, contact there whether you will get the help or how much in order it will be or uh, what kind of an approach can you kind of an adopt to even walk through this kind of a space. In contrast you look at settlement and there are these mental constructs people living in slums are all you can say uh, antisocial, uh, there is uh, no order, there is lot of filth, there is this kind of maybe criminal behavior. So, do you want to go through this, this kind of a thing or where does it kind of uh, locate itself? We know that uh, in um, the all the cities of India definitely next to every high rise building you will definitely see a slum settlement. It is an essential evil because you, you do need the service of those people to maintain even your whatever uh, apartments and blocks they, they, they constitute the service sector, but generally people say that is an eyesore and we know that whatever attempts are made is it is it is yielding results, but not in the way that we desire, but what I am trying to kind of convey here is that kind of a settlement that kind of a settlement which is simply not. So, an individual house vis a vis a settlement, but that is built space that is man made that is not given natural. It definitely as I mentioned even earlier it, it conveys something to you in terms of the social distance you want to carry with you, you want to adopt in order to kind of move around. Then I mentioned the third most important aspect of uh, understanding the built environment relates to the ideas values and beliefs of the people. So, the first one is that of the pyramid. So, this is uh, how people spent enormous amount of money to construct something for the dead. So, that is definitely a belief system. Uh, of a particular group of a particular community at a particular point of time. So, we do have these, but then you may want what a waste of maybe money or something like that. Do we have the space or do we need to do it, but that reflects the beliefs and the values. See when we talk of culture, when we say, say ideas, beliefs and values, it could be religion, it could also be a religious values. So, this is a reflection of a, a structure which directly relates to a historical uh, period and a particular group. So, when we try to reconstruct the culture of people definitely civilizations, we tend to use these material cultures for us the built environment, 
that is why the Harappa, Mohenjo-daro excavation and things like that. When we are trying to reconstruct culture, these artifacts, I told you culture is that complex whole of artifacts and mentifacts. So, these artifacts constitute a very, very significant component of understanding a particular culture. The, the other picture is that of the, uh, the St. Thomas Church in the city of Chennai. So, that is again as I mentioned earlier, the tallest building should be the place of worship. Whereas, here you see a very tall structure is a place for the dead. So, it, it kind of uh, tells us this range of structures that can be made. Uh, which definitely gives us some idea as to either how people lived or what they did or how they tried to kind of um, uh, religion itself is, uh, is a kind of a, a domain where it defines in many ways our present lives. So, that is an entirely different um, area for us in sociology, but we are just trying to see how these are reflected in the built spaces. Now, the use of materials, I will quickly run through this uh, examples of this trajectory of change in the use of materials. This is stone. So, both in a public space and a private space, uh, how, um, how earlier it was uh, not possible to construct their own houses. So, people made houses inside stones and this is the use of wood, the Padmanabha Param palace and also uh, a log house. And then this is the use of steel in a public space and a private space, um, but both are I think public spaces here. This is the Howrah Bridge and of course, uh, one of the modern airports in India and uh, concrete of course, you are all more familiar with that. So, one of the first tallest buildings in the city of Chennai was the LIC building. At one point of time, it was a great wonder and then there have been uh, many more uh, structures that have come up. Now, quickly I want to tell you uh, how these buildings are viewed as non-verbal communication. See, in trying to understand human behavior, uh, we look for cues or we look for hints or we look for signals as I told you as I started earlier to help us behave in the right way. Now, in this context, the built environment can give us these sets of you can say uh, what Rappaport has said uh, constitute three sets of cues or you can say hints. One is the fixed feature of, uh, of the built environment. Uh, those are the structures, those are permanent, you cannot do anything with them. They constitute the walls, maybe the ceiling. So, the size, the location, the height, all these things uh, significantly play, you cannot do anything with that. But those tell us as I as we just very recently I mean as we just looked at it the the tallest building will always be the place of worship. So, some of these fixed structures you cannot do anything with it you cannot change you cannot modify. I remember one of the in the whatever in this institute higher ceiling or doors which are you can say um, much much higher than my height difficult to operate. So, things like this you cannot do anything with it. The second one is, but then you, you get these cues or you get these hints, oh this is an office space, uh, this is uh, whatever um, an uh, uh, individual room or this is a classroom. So, these spaces tell us the size, the location, the height, whatever it is, give us some kind of an idea and to uh, on the kind of use that room is going to be or that space is meant for. The semi fixed feature elements of any built space is the most important, because those are totally under the control of the individual or the group, something that you can modify, something that you can change, something that you can personalize. So, these semi fixed elements in recent times or always have been uh, the most important aspects of you can say culture and the built environment. And that is what is seen in present times as well. The semi fixed elements can range again from you can say even furnishing uh, from drawing these getting these kind of new curtains and how you alter the interiors to the semi fixed elements also maybe include the furniture that you will 
the, the kind of materials that you may want to kind of buy, purchase in trying to furnish your space inside or maybe even some of the exteriors. And these semi fixed elements again are very, very strongly linked to culture. If you recall, I do not have pictures, but the decorative external door of the Chetinad houses. So, some of these things can be changed and that is very, very different from the interior doors of many of the rooms that, that you will see within the same building. Uh, so, the exterior versus the interior, the whatever the materials that you use uh, within the living space where vis a vis some of the interior spaces like perhaps even the kitchen or whatever it is. So, the semi fixed elements is something that is within the control of the individual or the group which keeps changing and which is very, very strongly linked to you can say the culture of that particular group and of different you can say locations. The non fixed aspect of non verbal communication is of course, the human beings the most vague, the most grey, the most difficult to kind of decipher. Why? Because the way when you enter a particular room, suppose there is some kind of a you can say um, entertainment or a party going on. So, where people are standing, the way in which they are using that particular space, the way in which they are using the furniture that is arranged there and through non-verbal is Non-verbal itself, it does not tell you, look in contrast to verbal communication which says do this, do that or it is even given, but through the behavior of people who are already there. So, we have seen the behavior of people to uh, how it can be influenced by the built environment, by the structures and the materials that can be used, but it has to also combine with the what we will say the non-fix human beings who are already inhabiting that space. So, here it is as I told you very difficult, but what is more important is how does non fixed relate to the semi fixed and the fixed. So, in a in a um, in an area like uh, examples are given of uh, shooting a conference over a period of say 3 days or 4 days, the formality of the the whole session at the inauguration time or on the first day to gradual setting in of informality where you can say the arrangement is even slowly you can say modified and then the and the, the formality or the social distance between the delegates of the conference also gradually changing. You cannot do anything with the fixed structures, but with the semi fixed and the non fixed we tend to become more comfortable or we always say these elements are very important because they can either facilitate human behavior or in many ways even hinder human behavior. Like we say uh, some of these structures in many buildings are very, very unfriendly to challenged people physically challenged or mentally challenged, it is not user friendly. And this is very important, these cues and hints are very important and whether you can change the fixed aspects of the built environment through the use of whatever newer and newer materials uh, and to what extent as I told you semi fixed is something that is changeable, to what extent that can relate and um, how do you make it more friendly or how do you try to kind of um, um, make it easier for people with lower competence as well to use. So, in this context how do newer and newer materials change the environment on the one hand, reflect the culture of people on the other hand and how it can also be introduced to as I told you does built environment reflect culture can built environment alter culture. So, some of the questions that we can think about in this context of this last 40, 45 minutes. So, what decides the choice of materials in these different places? So, there we see the actual role of culture influencing and how do the perception of people, individuals or collectives to a great extent define these kind of choices. Then as I mentioned can built environment alter culture or can build or does built environment always only reflect culture 
And the most important question is, can building materials be seen as an agent of change? See, what we are trying to address now is, can the built environment alter culture, which is happening in a very big way. Uh, the whole settlement patterns are changing due to various other compulsions and constraints, lack of space. So, from kind of horizontal expansion, we are going to vertical expansion. Then naturally, we are trying to put different kinds of people together in particular spaces and we are trying to force them to behave in different ways, either to relate with each other or to the rest of the community. So, can building materials be seen as an agent of change in society? So, one of the classic examples in recent times is a whole settlement that is changing both in structure and in terms of you can say function uh, is these huge settlements that have been reconstructed the post tsunami episode in uh, Tamil Nadu. So, large settlements which were main, mainly made of you can say mud houses with thatch roofing uh, due to various uh, very progressive thinking planners have been converted into supposed to be called safe shelters made of concrete. And what happens is this is seen why? Because giving a concrete house is not only some kind of an upward mobility for that large section of people who cannot afford to build a house on their own, but also is seen as an agent of change. So, it is not only an economic asset for them, but it is also seen as a strategy for upward mobility. And that is why for uh, if you look at the rural areas or if you uh, go to you can say certain kinds of uh, settlements with people belonging to economically weaker sections, uh, for them to have a house with a first floor an upper storied house is a significant marker, is a significant you can say identity identification factor that reflects their not only economic standing, but some kind of you can say movement in terms of the social distance that can be bridged in terms of planned intervention. That is why disasters and tra tra tragedies or whatever it is are not necessarily seen in always in a negative way. They are also taken in some ways as a positive uh, you can say uh, domain where planned intervention can alter. And this is where built environment is seen as a very important agent that can alter you can say the behavior of people, the social distance. So, in contrast to my earlier slide where I say oh that is a slum, I do not want to walk through it. So, that perception can be changed when we have this huge settlement of concrete houses. Oh, I am not able to make out whether they are the economically weaker sections or the very poor or the very perception of this kind of a settlement with different kind of material can bridge that social distance or also take people closer. So, uh, this uh, in sum is uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, if you have any questions, any queries based on uh, the particular presentation, uh, you can raise them now. Well, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Prema for a very uh, nice talk, a different talk for us as engineers and also I think it brings uh, the course, course into a different type of context because people are very important for all uh, engineers because they are the final uh, clients or the users of engineering structures. I had a couple of questions. One is that uh, sometimes you find that the user or the person who is living in a house or going to use a space insists on a certain material where uh, you know the as an engineer that that is not the most adequate. So, how would you deal with that? How, what would be the correct way to deal with something like that? Uh, the, the situations are very different. I remember when we did the tsunami housing um, whatever project even earlier like um, one thing is most of the scientists and technicians feel that 
people do not have that knowledge to make the right choices. What matters or what is most important is the user. Now, there is only one way you will have to inform the user or convince the user and that can be done with a lot of I mean not by throwing technological jargons or trying to kind of uh, brush away their uh, um, anxieties, but in many ways I remember when uh, some of these people in the tsunami houses wanted uh, concealed wiring because that is fashionable in many of the houses or structures in the cities. But then what weapon did we use? We said what is your culture? I am sure you are going to put many photos and pictures on those walls soon after, which is not true in an urban middle class house. I mean you are very, very choosy about what you want to exhibit where and then you take that, but that is not their level of you can say showing uh, to the external world. So, when we try to explain to them that where are you going to hammer a nail and will you take all these things into consideration, you will not know and what are the dangers involved. I, I remember that they willingly understood the logic. So, it depends on the kind of a client or the customer and I suppose the best thing to do is look at their ideas, values, beliefs, why is it they are trying to do? Is it just simply because of imitation or because they think that they can afford? And what is the kind of, a, so they say this customizing a particular built space is very important because not only does it uh, in the long run become more successful, but also it, uh, it is uh, important for the maintenance of that kind of a space that you may be giving them. So, like in concrete houses we know one of the failures that we anticipate is they will not know how to kind of settle any of the maintenance issues that may have cropped up even in the last 8 to 10 years. So, there is that great danger, but knowing the people, their values, ideas I think will always help. One more question, uh, see, the traditionally when uh, an engineer designed a building and constructed, the materials used were supposed to last throughout the life of the structure like a flooring would they would be durable so that this as long as the structure is used the same flooring could be used. But now we see a tendency that changes are made. Now is this something that the engineer should now adapt and say that let us look for materials that can be changed often and uh, do you think that this is something that uh, is perceived as a new way of construction and should the engineer adapt to that? Uh, see this again, I mean we are in an age of use and throw everything, I mean from pens to clothes to whatever it is, we are in, so the values are changing. Uh, but we still have people who would prefer ambassador cars and there are still people in India who want to keep a fridge in their house for 25 years. Uh, so I mean you have these range of clients and users, so it depends on for whom you are constructing, the affordability is one part. And that is where the durability aspect, uh, the safety aspect is very much you know and even if you look at you can see the class structure within the Indian context, it varies a lot. So, I told you even if you take the middle class, we will say the middle class values, the middle class morality, they will look for certain kinds of things. And perhaps it is very different from you can say the upper class or the rich or whatever they can. I mean uh, they do not have anything to lose, so uh, it is more fashionable. Now people want to change their cars every second year, not because it is worn out, is not it. So it depends on the user and we are living in an age of rapid I would say uh, transition and uh, as I mentioned the use and throw culture is uh, very, very significant not only amongst the students or youngsters, but also across uh, all generations. So, it is uh, what is it that is going to be important? I think the you can the for the builder, for the designer, the options, the cards can be put on the table. Now, what is it you want? Let them make the choice. There will be people who would be willing to go for a higher cost if what is important is uh, long term uh, sturdiness, that is what you want. 
but I do not care for me I am looking for something when you have these temporary partitions itself. No, we want a temporary material because it can change any time or we want a temporary material so that the space can be used for other things which is what we are seeing in many of these corporate structures because when space is not rented out it must be viable to be rented out to other kinds of uses like maybe uh, whatever a conference space, a hall, a marriage hall or whatever it is. So, you want to use those temporary because things are changing. So, for the designer, for the builder, I think uh, finally, what matters is uh, who is paying for it and what are his priorities. Because the user for me uh, is more important than the designer. Uh, final question Prema, see in, uh, in the engineering curriculum, we do not bring in the social aspects generally, but from your lecture and for what we know, it is very important that the people's choice or how people make uh, react choices. to make choices yes, yes. is very important. How can we make the changes in our curriculum to bring in these aspects, such as uh, such as those that you have discussed? I think, see, this uh, built environment and society itself is such an interdisciplinary domain. It draws from sociology, it draws from history, it draws from psychology and it also draws from architecture and it draws from construction. I think the best thing for us is, see in social sciences as well, I mean more so in social sciences, um, this kind of giving and taking, uh, because we are all looking at human behavior, uh, is becoming more and more important compared to the earlier, I would say, era where uh, very closed disciplinary um, growth seem to be most important. But most of these disciplines in social sciences have reached their whatever peak and they have established themselves. But when in a constantly changing society, this kind of an interdisciplinarity helps. So, I think technology and society should also become more and more intertwined, they should weave into each other and to give students this kind of a more comprehensive understanding of any space, I think would be useful in the longer run. So, in this institute since we have this kind of a you can say um, provision for exchanges, I think more and more uh, we anyway we are trying it out already. So, that would be helpful for the technology or an engineering students to give social science inputs into domains in technology and for social science students to be aware of something that is oh there is something all that is modern western science is not good all that is modern western science is also not bad. So, how do we integrate uh, science and society technology and society or engineering and the social sciences. I think more courses which can blend some components uh, should make it more even interesting. Thank you very much. It is past time, past time. Good, very good. Switch off. <laughs>